So you got to know him over the, in, in his later years. I really got to know him really better. I was around him a lot as a little kid, you know, 10, 11, 12, so, and then from time to time would see him, but the, the later years were really where I got to know John. Now they say that he was uh, a friend for life once you, he became... Yeah, pretty much so. And, uh, and uh, he was just a great common sense guy. And uh, you've probably heard the stories that, you know, when he was the, with the flying wing uh, and with Northrop and uh, Gemini, the, uh, they came out with one airplane and they didn't really have all the test facilities they've got now. So, you know, uh, a plane was built and Meyer said, this thing isn't going to fly, but if anybody can fly it, I can fly it. And he did, and the thing crashed, and I, they ran up to him. He said, well, I really made a mess out of that one. But anyway, he was in the hospital a little bit, and when they got to do the test on the first flying wing, the backup pilot took it up, and it crashed and killed everybody. And the backup pilot was a guy by the name of Edwards, and they named the Muroc Dry Lake Test Facility after Edwards. So it's now Edwards Air Force Base, and other than the accident, it would be probably known as Myers Air Force Base if he'd flown on that on that flight. And it, you know, just you never know. Did he? Uh, what kind of an attitude did he have? Was just a real fun. Up to yeah, he he loved people and fun. And uh, you know, it's one of those deals. You, you you only get one. It's not you know there are no rewrites. It's a uh, it's uh, you know it's not a dress rehearsal. And he enjoyed people, and uh, he just had a knack, you know, for flying. And you've heard all these stories, but I said, you know, John, when did you start to fly? He said, well, he says, I was at Stanford, and a guy was going to give me lessons, and I got the book and read all the stuff, and I was going out to do just sort of a practice thing on it, and uh, hell, this ought to work. And he said, next thing I knew, I pulled back this thing, and I was flying and he says, so I really didn't have any instruction. My first flight was a solo. And he said, it's just, I just had a feeling for it. And you can't explain it. Some people have it and others work for a long time and never quite get the feeling. And that's, you know, obviously uh, the thing that made him the, the pilot uh, that he was. And he sort of shied away from the term maestro that... Uh, he, he was given, but, uh, you know, he just, he loved to fly, and he was very good at it. Somebody said that he used to call himself Skinhead or something. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was, well, this old Skinhead is on his way down to wherever and so forth. Yeah, he was sort of self-deprecating in that, in, that, uh, in that way. But uh, uh, it was, yeah, I remember Lou says, when he was Lou growing up, he said, the only thing about being so close to Dad is I know what I'm going to look like when I grow up. Now, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Lucia, or Lucia? Well, you know, she was just a great lady. Uh, I didn't know her as well, of course, as I knew John. But uh, from, you know, from early on till she passed away, she was just a stunner and smart as a whip and just very engaging and just, you know, a marvelous person. Now, uh, his son, Lou. Lou. Yeah, can you tell us a little about him a little bit? Well, Lou, I was here again, was in our camp at, at, uh, uh, at, at the, the, in the Bohemian Club. And uh, so he and I, he and I shared uh, a, a lot of stories about diving and water work and, and that type of thing. I was a diver in the Navy. And, uh, the, and so that was the, the, the thing that we've kind of shared about. And then it just, it seemed so quick that all of a sudden... He was gone. Now you went into the service. What? Uh, you went, why'd you pick the Navy? Uh, well, I uh, I went in. Uh, I was on an ROTC scholarship at Stanford, and when I uh, when when I came out, uh, or while I was going along, a, a there was a grad student who was a, a a swimmer at Yale that was coming back, going through business school, and he had served in underwater demolition in the Navy, and uh, I was already in. The naval program, but then I started, and I was a swimmer at at, at Stanford, and uh, so that became my focus. And uh, so when I when I graduated, was commissioned 
I was uh, for a short period of time on a surface ship and then went into uh, underwater demolition training and actually uh, was class 20, which now they're into the 300s. Uh, and underwater demolition is now was the forerunner of SEALs. And uh, matter of fact, they shifted all those and uh, UDT 11 became SEAL Team 5. And uh, I've stayed very close with, those are some of my closest friends of the guys I knew in the teams. What years were you, were you in service? Uh, from 57 through 60. So, uh, and then I stayed active with a reserve for another 13 years or so and uh, was CO of a reserve unit and uh, would go back to do your active duty for training. And uh, uh, it, by this time, I've got a wife and family and they were not calling reserves. And so I, I, I dodged all, all the excitement. I was ready, but I just didn't have the guts to go and say I volunteered when I was running a company and had kids to support. So, so you didn't go into Vietnam? Then. No, I didn't. I was actually, we were, it was pre-Vietnam. It was, uh, I was attached to a, a, a group and we were working as advisors to the Chinese. So I was spent a bunch of time on Taiwan and working with Chinese UDT. And at that time, uh, a group from Team 12 came out and took the first special ops in, in, in Southeast Asia, which they took a bunch of boats up the Mekong River to Vietnam, Luang Prabang. Uh, uh, Dave Del Judas was my roommate going through, uh, going through training, and he was with the, the Team 12 group that took it up, came back, and they said, boy, there's some serious stuff going on. Dim and Fu was over with, but you know that was kind of had faded now into the into the in, in, you know over the horizon. But there was still things cooking in Southeast Asia that we were kind of looking at. The trouble area at that point in time really was Indonesia, and uh, the uh, so anyway, Dave later became the the first commanding officer of SEAL Team One, and uh, then uh, was formative into putting together the, the report on how SEALs would go ahead and, and operate in Vietnam. And uh, so anyway, we, we as a group have stayed pretty close over the years. The other one was, the, the other commanding officer was the first commanding officer of SEAL Team 2 on the East Coast, a fellow named John Callahan. And we were all at, at that time at UDT, well, 11 and 12, all West Coast. 